Greetings from Podcastville. It's Wednesday, the 15th of July. You better pay your taxes, cop sucker. <laughs> the Church of What's Happening Now is brought to you by Express VPN. Listen, right now we're all living our lives on the internet. Your kids got school on the iPad, your wife's got the in laws on FaceTime, and you're just trying to watch the church and mind your own business. But now more than ever, you need to protect your privacy online. Trust me. You're probably thinking, why not just use a private code? Because I hate to break it to you, that's not going to work. No matter how many times you erase your history, people can still see every site you've ever visited. Mm -hmm. So, with ExpressVPN, what I do online is nobody's business. To protect your online activity today with VPN that I trust to secure my fri fucking privacy right now, the church family can go to expressvpn.com slash church to get three extra months free on a one-year package. That's expressvpn.com slash church. Listen, you're anonymous. Get an IP address that can't be tracked. Today, go to expressvpn.com slash church and get an extra three months free on a one-year package. That's ExpressVPN. Kick this motherfucking meal, Lee. Oh, shit. It all starts fucking today, all right? No more fucking excuses. This is the year of the fucking soldier. We're going in like fucking Marines. You understand me? Welcome to church, motherfucker. Oh, shit. <laughs> Wednesday, cocksuckers. We're here. We're queer. You know what I'm saying? What do you want from me? Uh, things are bad all over. Thank you for watching me on the uh, Fight Companion. We had a great time. Fights were great, the whole fucking thing. Uh, it was great to see Joe. You know, it's tough right now because we don't see... I haven't seen Theo since February. I haven't seen Tom. I saw Sickle one time. I haven't seen anybody. I see Lee. I see Steve Simone, you know. But uh, I didn't want you guys to think. We don't see anybody, you know. I haven't seen Eliza. I haven't seen, uh, you know, Ali Wong. I, I don't know what these people are doing. I try to check with, in with as many as I can, but uh, it's overwhelming what's going on right here in L.A. I know that Texas is on fire. Arizona's on fire. Florida's on fire. My heart goes out to you. You know, we're on fire. We'll probably be on uh, level one by Thursday. That's a reality. By tomorrow, we'll be on level one. I mean, that could be a reality. So, uh Things are looking bleak out here today. You know, I go for my little afternoon ride. I do a bunch of shit in the morning to stay busy. And then uh, I come over here. I check the office, uh, make sure the gate is closed. Uh, and I went out to to the main street here, Lancashire. And I was telling Lee, I had to tell you guys, I'm parked at the light. I'm minding my own business. It's maybe 2, 2.45. I'm sitting there at the light. I'm the second car behind the car. And all of a sudden, out of because I'm headed towards like you know, um, there's a train station there that's always been a little bit on the fucking evil side. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, every train station. Every weird. train. This one is not bueno. They sell tamales. You shit blood for a week. The pork, <laughs> the pork had splinters in it. What kind of fucking pork has splinters in it? It's a shady fucking place. I used to walk my wife there when she worked downtown. I would walk her every morning because it was that shady, you know, and. Uh, I'm watching out of, out of my left eye, and I'm seeing a commotion, guys. And next thing you know, I see a guy go down. What? Just go down, like fall, bam. He fell from the sidewalk to the street, and he was holding on to his head. Oh, no. And then a, la a guy, a lady was waiting for the bus, but she was looking towards me. like She didn't even see it coming. And he clocked her in the head with a shot, an axe with no axe on it, just a handle. He clocked her in the head. <laughs> then he clocked another dude on the rib. That guy went down. And then he started to proceed to hit this guy. And this guy ran away from him. Now the light turns green. We're about to move. And this guy runs across the street. And the guy with the axe handle is chasing him across the street. And they go into the train center. And they're sprinting. So I make a fucking U-turn. You know me. I'm Batman. I'm going to intercept this guy and hit him with the car. This is my excuse right here. This is my big chance to shine, right? Because oh one God. of those, you got to hit those guys with a fucking, I'll just run them over with the Subaru at this <laughs> point. I'll be in the paper tomorrow. Joey Diaz is a hero. He saves a life. Hit him with the door? Yeah, I was going to hit him with something. So I made a U-turn, and I cut down the fucking alley. 
because he was running down the train street right there. What did he look like? What did the guy with the axe look White, like? White, five foot eight. Homeless or not? Uh, he looked a little homeless. He looked a homeless. He had like a leather vest on. Oh, I taped the Warriors there, not I haven't watched <laughs> it yet. So he had like a little leather vest on and uh, like brown pants. And I fucking, when he hit him, he the, 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 the chubby guy ran first. Then the guy ran after him with the axe handle. <laughs> and then two security guys ran after him. With fucking walkie talkies. What good are they gonna do? <laughs> They're chasing them. So I make the U turn. I shoot down the fucking thing. I'm driving the same way he's going. I'm figuring I'm gonna fucking meet him right there. But he runs the other way. Now he doesn't have the axe handle no more. And when I went to look, he the guy that he was chasing was on the floor. There was blood all over his fucking head. Oh, he was on no. the floor already. He must have had him two or three times with the axe handle. But he dropped the axe handle, so his fingerprints are on it. So he ran down. I chased him, but he made a left into the fucking bus terminal. Like, he, he went around the corner. Right. Back towards the train. Like, they weren't going to see him. This guy's nuts. Jesus Christ. But this is happening, you know, eight blocks from my house, three blocks from the office. And then I went on Ventura Boulevard. I had to go to the bank and fucking deposit the... Uh, the I got like those residual checks from stupid movies and nice. TV shows. Those, those penny, those penny uh, two dollars and fifteen cents. They've been sitting there for a week. I figured <laughs> I had to take a ride, right? You know, like when you're just sitting there. I'm looking at these three checks. Between the three checks, they add up to ten bucks. Okay, <laughs> it's like two fifteen. But I'm not just gonna throw them away, bro. Ten dollars is ten dollars. There's a lot of people who need ten dollars. Who the fuck am I to throw away? So I'm like every day I do something different. Like you know what's on my list tomorrow? What? Getting gas. <laughs> like, you know, when you have getting gas on your list, you know things are fucking slim, okay? Oh. So I'm getting gas tomorrow. So I can't make any plans because then I close the camp. Right. Oh, no, no, but I don't want to forget. You're on, you're on Ventura. I'm on Ventura. Yeah. I'm minding my own business. Right. What's our favorite Chinese restaurant? Sushi Dan? No, Chinese. Oh, Chinese. Uh, green Apple, I'm sorry. Dog. On the corner, a guy totally naked. <laughs> Waving at people. <laughs> you, now, tell these people that neighborhood. That's unlike here. That's a nice white neighborhood. Cross the street from Arts Deli. It's like the Beverly Hills of the Valley. Guys, <laughs> it's like the Beverly Hills of the Valley. And there's a naked man on a corner, and nobody's talking to him. Just doing like yours, like the vote for me wave? Like yeah, <laughs> like nobody's beeping at him. Nobody's existing his existence. You, you don't see some of the stuff like that in L.A. every once in a it's while. It's crazy. Now, something happened. Okay, guys, if I walk out to Lancashire, if I walk out to Tahunga, Tahunga's right down the corner. There's a fire department, then there's the health department. That area by the health department, guys, it's so bad at night. So there's a new hotel across from the health department that's fucking empty. They built that hotel for like 18 years, and they opened it like March 1st, <laughs> right for Corona, the Corona. The grand opening was like March sixteenth. They they've been empty. You go in there right now, you get a room for ten bucks. It's a beautiful little hotel, and next one is a coffee shop, and next one is a Lutheran church. Okay, now I don't know nothing about Lutheran people. <laughs> and across Weird. from the Lutheran church is a Lutheran school that belongs to the church. It's called Saint Paul's. When my wife was looking for a daycare for Mercy, my wife went everywhere. But all these people around here serve like goat cheese and shit to your kid. So my wife didn't want that for my child. You know, they were all like fucking, oh, they eat sushi for lunch or brown rice. My wife's like, what happened to fucking apples? Yeah, what happened you know, to burger? You know, they were all very like menage a trois type places, you know. So uh, my wife settled on St. Paul's. And in my personal experience with them, I loved them. I don't care if they're Lutheran, Jewish. Catholic. I don't even know what a Lutheran is. But the point being, I've trusted my daughter with them for two or three years. I think Mercy went in there at one and a half. And she got out of there when she was five. She's basically family over there. One of the girls sleeps at my house three nights a week. I don't even see her. <laughs> I don't even see her. She comes in after I go to bed. And she wakes up at six and leaves. Takes a shower. Helps my wife out. She's great. Uh, her father is the principal. And then there's another teacher there 
that hangs out with my wife. These are good people. These are great American people. They're white people, but they ain't bothering nobody. So this church is stuck next to this fucking neighborhood that, you know, that back street there where the Buddhist temple is and mm -hmm. that other Lancashire school. That Lancashire school is where they did the Jax Teller. When Jax Teller did, when they did the school shooting in uh, Sons of Anarchy, that's the school they use. It's, it's behind, it's behind that street next to a karate school behind NoHo Diner. So all that is that area there. It's really bad. One day I saw a guy laying on his stomach drinking water from the fire department, was washing their truck. He was and drink, the, licking the water oh. from the floor. Yeah, just so you guys know, this is all, this is within walking distance of that train station we were talking about and the uh, the Greyhound station. The gray, and there's a Greyhound station that's horrible. And those people that sit out there, it closes at 6 o'clock at night. And it reopens like at four in the morning, so those people just walk around the fucking neighborhood, and they go to NoHo Diner, and NoHo Diner is serving outside. You know, they, NoHo Diner is a scary place. Oh yeah. Like when you go in there at two in the morning, you better you pray for your life to don't get robbed, because they're close to the one seventy. I don't like that place. I love Yum Yum Donuts to get a donut, but as far as fucking going in there at night and sitting there and writing jokes, it's never gonna happen. <laughs> they're gonna get hit one day. You know what oh, I'm saying? Yeah. It's right there off the 170. So did you see something over by the church today, too? So, no. So my point is the church is across the street from how big is the park, bro? A few football fields. Remember, there's two parks. There's Noho Park. Then there's a park across the street. And they have a library. They have tennis courts. They have a swimming pool. Baseball field. A baseball field that's huge. A rec center. And then behind, they have a skateboard camp. Yeah, back yeah, there, yeah. and on Thursdays they do uh, food trucks, and there's hundreds of people there every week. They have you know a lobster truck and fucking Thai food and Puerto Rican food, and <laughs> sometimes they have they do they really do they have Puerto Rican food. I look at it every Thursday. I oh, used yeah. to go. Yeah, I, yeah, we, we used, used to go. Yeah, we yeah. used to go. We used to go on Thursday nights when my daughter went to St. Paul. We would pull her out. Anyway, back to St. Paul. So. The lady comes over one night and she's telling my wife that the school has been fucking crazy lately. We're all wearing masks. We're in the front of the house. We're outside. And we're talking about St. Paul's. And she's telling us how the school's been crazy over there lately. That um, they woke up, they opened up the school and then there was a homeless guy in the school. Oh, no. They had to call the cops and the cops had to come and the guy refused to go. And then another guy broke into the homeless school and they took a shit. And then they defaced the property. Again, if you've ever seen the episode of Sons of Anarchy with Gemma, when Jimmy Smith confronts Gemma after she, he finds out that she killed Jax Teller's wife, there's gates. You'll see it. The first scene that she does when she calls Jimmy Smith, she's at that church. The second scene, she's in front of the daycare center. I feel like you might have seen Sons of Anarchy. So if you guys have ever seen Sons of Anarchy, it's the episode when Jim, <laughs> towards the end, it's like either the last two episodes, she shoots all day. And then she says goodbye to the kid, the grandson, and they shot that scene across the street at the baseball field. Oh, so there's a ton of room there, guys. My point is, there's a ton of fucking room in that area to sit any way you want. So the other day, I wake up, and my wife goes, do you see what's going on right now? And I go, no. What's going on now? Another fucking guy got shot or something. What the fuck happened now? And she goes, St. Paul's is on TMZ. It's trending on TMZ because an African-American woman sat under one of the trees and they have no trespass. Oh, that was there. Uh, Did you see that? Yeah. Did you hear about it? I mean, yeah, you see, you see that one side of a video. Yeah. But here's the thing. Did you watch the video? Yeah. You know. Like the guy told her, you know, it, they're like fucking old white people over there. They're not there looking for problems or anything like that. I don't think they explain themselves right. Like, you don't understand we're having a ton of problems here with people breaking in, and we just don't want anybody on the property. It, we feel uncomfortable with you on our property. I actually had someone pull something on me recently with this. Like, sim it's a very similar thing. Uh, my car just got broken into in my apartment complex, and I have a, my my apartment complex has like a gate to get to park in a garage 
and there's this big Mexican dude with a truck pulled up right at the front of the gate and said, hey, I'm coming to see my grandma. Can you open the gate for me? I said, you know what, man? I'll go grab her for you if you want. What apartment is she in? And he wouldn't do it. And I was like, he's like, oh, no, let me just come in. I'm like, no, you know what? I'm sorry. I can't do that. But I can, I'll, I'll go grab her for you. And he, he, he said to me, he said, is it because I'm Mexican? I said, I, he didn't know that I broke up with Paul. I said, no, I'm, I did a Mexican girl. I just can't let someone into the apartment. And he he, he back, he gave up and he left. I don't think he actually was seeing someone no, in there. No. But it, it is, it's, I, it's a really big topic right now. So people get upset, but it doesn't like when people say, are you racist? It feels, it's like a, it's a, a kind of an attack. Like it feels like you're being attacked almost. Well, it's very scary. Agitators. Okay. There's now we're seeing what's called agitators. And you church people are seeing it. You guys are seeing it. They, they, they're just agitators. They just go out and they go from Dean Cain to, and they agitate. And they try to shake people's tree up, you know, and it's a shame. I know those people at St. Paul's. They did not deserve a write-up. Now, do you know the back end to that? No. Then they got protesters there on Sunday. Guess what they did? They invited them in. Oh, that's and, nice. the, and they invited the African American girl to church there to see what they're all about, and now they're good. But they got ripped through the fucking mud for no reason. I mean, yeah, there was a reason. The girl took it wrong. You know, they told the African American girl she couldn't sit there. And guess what happened the next day? I went over to the check on them. There was a white guy sitting on the lawn, just to see if they would come out and bust their ball. Oh, you think so? I know so. That's the degree. Of what's going on right now. Yeah. That's the degree of what's going on right now. Now, when you see it on the news or you see it happening somewhere else, you go, wow, that could happen. Guess what? It's happening here. We just went to level two, right? We're level one or two. I think we're back down to level one one, because they closed everything. They closed pretty much everything. People are refusing to close. We We got a state that's fucking divided here. Orange County was on the California. It's on the L.A. border. Orange County wants to open their schools with no social distancing and masks. You know, listen, guys, 4% <laughs> of people getting COVID uh, are kids under 10. You know, the percentages are fucking wild. You know, the problem with those kids is that shit spreads with those kids. I get both. I get both views. Listen, I don't want my daughter at home all fucking day. She's got to go to school. But I'm also concerned about the teachers. You know, they have families. They go to places. You know what? The teachers have to live in isolation too. But at the same time, a child can't spend five hours a day on a computer learning. It just doesn't comprehend. It doesn't flow right. They need the socialization. They need to see other kids their age. They've said it a thousand times. They speak their own fucking language. I mean, you so you've had her at home since it's like four or five months. Do you see a difference with her? Did you see a difference with the end of the school year? Or? I saw. First of all, I'm no fucking doctor. The first month, March sixteenth uh, to April first, I saw a kid that didn't really know what was happening. You know, she didn't really know what was happening around her. She didn't understand why she wasn't going to school. You know, we had the news on at night, and she would pop up from time to time, and she started asking about COVID, and and then she, you know, they're not stupid. They're not stupid. They listen. Just because she's playing her fucking Nintendo Switch in the living room doesn't mean she's not listening to 894 deaths reported today in fucking New York City. She heard all of that. Then by April, you know, we fig- we got it down early. We got the process down early. You know, I saw what my wife was doing. I go, whoa, we're doing it wrong. When they go to school in the morning, we take her there at 8, but she doesn't go into the classroom until 8.25. You know why they do that? They let them get their yayas out. That first burst of fucking energy from the cereal. You got to assume they had Captain Charcula, and they're ready to strangle the motherfucker. So... That's what I assume in the mornings, that she's ready to strangle the motherfucker, which if you see her at 8.15, you know she's ready to go. So at 8.15, we had to take her out, guy. And guys, I, you know I've been through hell in my life. 
You don't know what hell is to you. You have to keep a kid occupied that is high energy. She's not a bad child, but she's very high energy. So you have to uh, keep her, you know, she's smart, man. And you have to challenge her mind from time to time. So every day we had to go to, we had different parking lots. Parks were closed. So we had to go to fucking parking lots. We had a uh, wiffle ball bat. One day, one day we had tennis with those little fucking butterflies. Oh, yeah. That- we brought hula hoops. You should have seen me hula hooping. I'm not a good hula hooper. You know what I'm saying? My hula hoop days are over with. You know, we bought bikes. She had a bike already. We we taught her how to ride a bike. That was good for about three weeks. Then that obviously got old, you know. You know, um, kids were hidden. We would take them to the park, and it was still not known what was going on. So there was no kids in our lives. And then we started figuring out the Zooming for them and FaceTiming. So she started FaceTiming with two or three of her friends. And then, thank God, one of the mothers is a nurse at a major hospital, and she broke down everything for us. She got us masks. I mean, this sounds... I mean, I grew up, and I feel like I was a nervous kid. Do you see her being anxious or nervous? No. She's... she's, I'm looking at her very closely. You know, I want her to stay healthy, but kids need kids. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a doctor. I know me, and I know how I was at that age. Yeah, I had my problems when I was young. I, You know, I, at first I was very insecure. My dad had died. You know, I'm building models. I'm staying in. Then my mom pushed me out there. And then once she pushed me out, there was no bringing me back in. Like, once I discovered the world and the freedom I had, you know, my wife and I were talking last night about something, and I go, we were talking about my friend that his daughter walks to the pizza place in Jersey. I go, can you believe that? He lets her go to the pizza place. Like, that's big, you know? And she <laughs> goes by herself. She's 12 with her uh, friends, you know? And my my wife is like, well, what were you doing at that age? I'm like, at seven, I remember still walking. Six, walking 30 blocks. My mom thought I was in the... 30 car. blocks? Yeah, like into Harlem to oh buy my God. hot pants by James Brown at Mercy's age. That's unheard of. Like two kids that are both six or seven. I think police would stop you now. No, yeah, now. Yeah, now. Yeah, <laughs> now. And we had beat cops then. There were cops on the fucking beat. You know? So. Yeah, I don't know who the fuck this is. So. There were cops on the beat. So, yeah, I didn't know what to expect. But right now, this is just. This shutdown is just not working. I mean, I know in Arizona, I don't know how you people are doing. Texas and Florida. I mean, you know. Uh, we're not going to recover from this for two years. Yeah, at least. There's no recovery. All you got to do is take a ride tomorrow into Melrose. That's all you need to do. Tomorrow at 12, take your little VW bucks there and go over the fucking hill. Just go to Joe's Pizza. Go to, down to Melrose, down on Crescent Heights, and make a left and come back home on the 101 and call me. And you let me know what you see the future like in L.A. It's not good. The comedy store is not coming back for a while. I hear rumblings about the Laugh Factory. Rumblings are out already about the Laugh Factory. I know the improv will never close, but they're not opening in the foreseeable future. Yeah, I mean, the only thing that's saving some of these other places is like the parking lot shows. And we don't really have parking lots in LA. Not in Hollywood, at least. Like I said, you know, I talked to Alonzo Bowden yesterday, and he said he did uh, a couple guest sets in La Jolla, and it was great, but it was like crack, like exactly what I told you. I don't want to go on stage till I could do it every night. For me to just go, I can go on stage tonight. You and I both know there's a place we go on stage tonight. A couple people have open mics. I could go. I could go every night if I wanted to. I just can't. I just can't right now. First of all, I gotta stay safe. There's a lot. Of, those open mics are kind of dirty. They don't, you know, because they're trying to hide them. The door is closed, so you're in there breathing with nine or ten people. So that's not good right there. So you know what? When when we're ready for stand up, we'll be ready for stand up. 
That's it. No big deal. I mean, yeah, guys, I'm mourning a little bit. When you see me now, I'm happy. I could swear to you guys, there's no depression. There's no nothing. I'm fucking happy. I'm, I'm okay with this. Everybody's losing money. I've accepted it. Life is not about money. It's about being happy. I've accepted all this shit. The comedy part about not going out at night, I'm having a little hard time with it. It's starting to bother me now. It really is eating away at me a little bit. Not enough to hit somebody in the head with an axe handle. Not enough to yell at my wife. None of that shit. Like, we're cool, me and my wife, the baby. The house is stronger than ever. It's just, I don't see a good future here. So now I got to make my decisions, you know. After this shutdown, this shutdown we did not need. I could have gone all summer. We could have gone all summer. How we were doing with recovery. But this shutdown just destroyed us. And let's be honest. This shutdown is going to be till November to the election. They're going to shut us down to do the mail-in fucking whatever. The mail-in voting. Or oh, that's a scam. That's a word on the street. So I've accepted it. Nothing I could do. Today, uh, yesterday morning, I got a call at 9.30 in the morning that my... Philadelphia date, October 24th, that I was fucking looking forward because, for. you know, I go to the Parks Casino. I get there on Thursday. I do nothing but eat that week. Let me tell you something. I save my <laughs> when I go to Philly, I save my Weight Watcher bonus points. I live like a skeleton all week until I get to Philly. I head to Philly. I got 45 points to kill plus the points I got for the day, <laughs> and I use every fucking one of them. I love Philadelphia with all my fucking heart. That breaks my fucking heart. They have canceled live events in Philadelphia till February of 2021. Are you fucking kidding me? How many places are going to survive? You know, Helium, I love that guy. He's got all those clubs, but that's... How is he going to keep the doors open till, uh, until February? You know, I mean, this is what's actually going on. I just got a call tonight from a dear friend of mine, but another friend of mine that's struggling. And I explained to him that after this closing, our friend cannot mathematically make it. He cannot mathematically make it in the business that he does. What he's doing right now is breaking even. If they force him to close again, he hasn't paid rent in three months. This is all, and the rent's got to be all paid in full by September 1. Oh, yeah. Mathematically, he cannot do it. What he could do is cut a deal with the landlord, make payments so it doesn't turn into a judgment, so nobody goes to court, and move on with his life. I mean, the, the sadness I have is that think of how many people have to close their business, look at each other and go, is this worth the hemorrhage? We worked for 30 fucking years to get to where we are. And we could either stay open because we have loyal employees or we could give our employees a loyal little check and close this motherfucker out. And you know already, you've read the people that have closed in Hollywood already. You've read the fucking places, 60-year-old places. All over the country. That's all the news everywhere. And I'm, I, I, I think both sides are our fault. But to me, it's, it's, I think the saddest part about this is it shows how divided I think a lot of people are. Because if we if we all as a country agreed to just shut down for two three weeks, this would be over. But because some places are different than other places, it it's gonna be. I think it's gonna go on for could go on for years. I see it once. I mean, when you go on Ventura Boulevard, you don't see. You see it. You see it a little bit, but you don't feel the gloom you do. As much as when you go to Hollywood. This is what I'm trying to say. I'm sorry about, you know, telling you all about... Listen, guys, they can't all be fucking uh, hilarity podcasts. Some of them have to be realism. We have to be real with one another. I told you guys March 16th that this was going to give people time to think, well, this fucking lockout, this next one, this last one, the one that got issued Tuesday, yesterday, this one broke me. Or part of it. Like, what about it? My daughter's not going to be able to go to school. We got camped to August 12th. If they shut the whole city down, 
Then we have no camp. And basically, we're only living here to do a podcast. There's no film. There's no TV. Not that that's what I'm interested in at all. At all, am I interested in that? But uh, I just see that we have to make a move. I don't know where. It's between Telluride, Austin, Texas. I mean, I've been thinking about a lot of places. I have a dear, dear friends in uh, RE, Colorado, and Gunnison. And uh, it's fucking beautiful on the Western Slope. But Colorado is only going to go to school in September to teach their kids how to fucking do homeschooling. So that's the fucking situation I got. Listen, sometimes you guys got to hear my fucking problems too. All right? Uh-huh. It's not all about you cocksuckers, okay? I come on here. I level my heart out for you. Sometimes I got to tell you what's going on here. Just so you know the real fact about fucking what's going on here in California. I don't know how you're feeling. I talked to King Condom today. She's in Florida, you know. She said she did a couple gigs. It was nice to talk to her, you know. Uh, That's a, one of the saddest things for me because I... She was thinking of coming back here. She called me. Yeah. We've been playing phone tag, and I called her, and then today she picked up, and she goes, I want to know if you think it's worth it for me to come back to October, November. I go, I don't think nothing's going to be here for you. I think you're way... New York, like, you know, word on the street is the numbers are ticking back up. In New Jersey. I don't know about New York. I haven't heard New York. I heard it's clean up in northern New York. They're going to open up a few schools and they're going to try or something. I don't really know. I don't really know what's going on. I know that if I go to New York, I'm quarantined for two weeks. That yeah. I do know. So As soon as you get there, you can't leave for two weeks? No. You're going to, you can't anywhere from Arizona, Texas, or Florida. When you go to New York, you got you got to quarantine yourself for two wow. weeks. Wow. That's good. I mean that's I mean that's what you were talking about with Rogan about about Jimmy in in Korea. It's like if these places that take it seriously and quarantine you. It's like you saw. Do you see that NBA player who got in trouble had to go back into quarantine because he got takeout food? No, <laughs> he got he got food delivered yeah, to the bubble. I, listen, <laughs> like, I tried to tell you guys that that bubble for basketball that's going to be very rough on them. That's going to be very, very rough on them. But that's what we need. My heart goes, no, 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 no. We need we need sports to help the economy. We need sports entertainers. I mean, obviously, they're not shooting anything new. They haven't figured it out. But at the same time, you want safety. Yeah. Okay? You're putting a bunch of millionaires in a bubble. <laughs> and I think their families are with them or whoever they want in there with them. But besides that, they're in a bubble. Remember, it's a lot different me traveling with you and playing with you than me traveling with you, playing with you, and living with you. That creates a different type of environment. I don't know how many weeks it's going to be. I think it's up to four months. But it's going to be very fucking tough. So you mean to tell me, I don't know how many teams are in this bubble. You mean to tell me, as a smart American, that Zion Williamson, the rookie sensation, and I hate to put it this way, but I have to, just so you people understand where I'm coming from. You're going to look me in the eye and tell me that Zion Williamson isn't going to sneak out to get his dick sucked? Yeah, it's hard to... <laughs> That's what you're telling me, that one of those NBA players doesn't have a dirty white chick waiting for him in Orlando, because that's a home of dirty white chicks. It's Orlando. That's a capital. Tons of dirty white chicks looking to suck dick. <laughs> they in must Orlando. be flocking there if they knew all the, it's a the entire NBA is there. Yeah, they must be flocking there. So think about it. And I'm not trying to be a wise ass. I'm not trying to crack stupid jokes. I'm just trying to be from a logical perspective here. Do you really think these guys are going to stay in there every night? Have you played sports? Have you ever traveled with that sports team? No. The first thing you want to do as a kid is sneak out. When I played bitty basketball, all that shit, I heard stories of fucking those guys sneaking out and buying beers and getting caught and putting sleeping pills in the coaches' milk. And, you know, this is what you did. You snuck out. You're a kid. How am I not going to have a good time in a hotel room? This is what you do. So you mean to tell me, I don't know how many teams are there, but each one of these guys is going to play basketball and stay in. And that's all they have to do is bat. I mean, they have even less to do than we do. That's it. 
they built amusements for them in there. There's shit for them to do in there. So they're not bored. I mean, we've all been in our homes for the last four months. How fucking <laughs> bored are you? They start organizing. <laughs> How fucking bored are most of you people that are fucking working from your house, living at your house, getting food delivered to your house? How fucking bored are you? At one point of the day, do you actually feel like crying sometimes? For me, it's 7 o'clock. Every night at 7 o'clock, I want to shed a tear. As soon as I hear the first key to dun, 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 Jeopardy, <laughs> I just want to fucking put my hands between my head and hold them and cry. But I don't. I don't. I look up and I go, you know what? We're going to work this thing through. You know, I, I feel. I feel terrible for America right now. There's people who are really fucking struggling. I know somebody who had a nervous breakdown last week. Got to go to the hospital. I had a great lady, dear friend of mine. It's just too much. It's overwhelming. Another friend of mine, his mother-in-law had so much anxiety that she dehydrated. Something happens to your uh, whatever levels of something. They had to rush her to the hospital to get like an IV because your uh, whatever Gatorade fucking supplies. Electrolytes? Did, electrolytes. Something was off in her body. So, you know, I mean, this is what's going on with people. People are drinking more than ever. Well, like, that's why it's interesting you talking about the kid earlier. I'm very lucky that the only person I have to worry about is myself. I can't imagine having the stress of of just me. And then not only do I have to worry about my kid, but I have to teach her, too. I have to I have to be now. Now I'm in school. Like on top I, listen, of I don't mind. I had to read a bunch of shit and reacquaintance myself. I mean, but what had, if you had to work here all day? She's had a I, dog. Dog. There's parents right now that are banging their heads on the wall in America. There are parents right now that are banging their heads on the wall because who's going to watch these kids? You got three kids. You work and I work. How are we going to fucking do this? So my heart goes out to those people. There are parents right now that are going, "Holy fuck!" If my kid doesn't go back to school, and that's the and and I was talking about some stuff earlier, but the other side of it is, how sad how sad is it that we we can't trust our government? I'm not saying that this is a ho fake or a hoax, but there's a there's at least a chance that this is fake. Like it, it's not, it doesn't sound crazy anymore to say that. I grew up trusting my. I, I grew up trusting the president, the 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 police, the fact like we. There's at least an inkling that we can't trust what they're telling us. Well, America is at a crossroads right now. You know, America's with, at a crossroads with the police. America's at a crossroads with African Americans. America's at a crossroads with Latinos. We're at a crossroads right now, and this crossroad could lead to a civil war. You know, uh, Seems like there's it. a lot of uh, African American hate crime now on other people. The videos have been posted. You know, people feel unsafe, uncertain. You know, when why it's going to be scary is because why I got scary as a human being. When my heart turned black, that's when I used to steal. When my mother died, I thought the world turned on me and. The government turned on me. They wanted paperwork for me to get money that was supposed to come to me from my father and my mother. So all those things broke down. So I'm reliving it. I'm seeing people go through what I went through at 16. Losing their job, losing your mother, losing a wife, losing a child, losing your job that you've been doing for 20 years. People, cameramen, directors, ADs, you know, all those people. People who went to school for editing. And been out here editing for 20 years. They're not shooting nothing right now. Right now, they're sitting at home tiddly winking, you know. Yeah, what about the kids on the other end who just graduated college? What about those kids? <laughs> and those students are coming What about through. not having a graduation? You know, all these things are weighing on people. Yeah. So, yes, your non-trust in the government, your confusion, and the morning of the death of you not having a job, you know, two weeks you lose your benefits. I mean, I hate to be fucking Joey Downer. But yes, this weighs on people. The reason why we do the podcast is so you understand that 
you're not the only one. I'm telling you guys, you're not the only one. So please, uh, listen. Uh, like I said it once. I live by these things. You never see a bookie with a part-time job, and there's no debtor's prison. There was a time when I thought my world was over, and I, it was just starting. It was just starting, and it was 29 years ago tomorrow. So 29 years ago tomorrow, I started comedy. You know, I did something that I never thought I would do. It was a changing of the guard. It was, uh, I was at the crossroads. I had a job, it paid me good money. I had a truck, I had a fucking cell phone. I, I had a cool, cush job, I could, you know you know me, I still wake, woke up at six and did the whole thing. But if I was a regular guy, I could get there at 11, and measure some roofs, not me. I got up at six and went down there and helped with the roofing, the supplies, and I went and did my bids and all this shit. I had it, but I one day I thought about it, and I'm like, this is it. This is it, till I'm 65. Then they give me a gold watch for being the estimator of the year. This is what I live for. This is what my mother, for. there's got to be more. There's got to be more. 29 years ago, yesterday, this is where I was. Right now, I was probably biting my fingers right now, thinking about stand-up, how I was going to fucking fail, how this was going to be embarrassing. Who the fuck was I? I had the worst thoughts going through my head, which are the same thoughts I'm, I got going through my head when I get on stage now. Who the fuck do I think I am? I'm a bum. Why am I even going down there? They're not going to laugh at me. And I got off that fucking stage, and the owner of the club said, great job, you had great stage presence. And people spoke to me, and next thing you know, I, I, people were shaking my hand, I was talking to different people, and I felt like fucking Karen at the wedding, at the uh, Goodfellas wedding. Remember, she was overwhelmed. There were so many Peters and Paulies in the room. I didn't know what the fuck was going on, you know? I mean, the next thing you know, I'm driving home with this woman who was my wife at the time, and I'm thinking, how am I going to do this for a living? How am I going to do this for a living? 29 years ago, tomorrow, uh, 29 years ago right now, I was probably biting my fucking nails, pissing my fucking pants, crying like a pussy, guys. Can you believe that? That on this night, 29 years ago, I was probably, I, I wish I could actually remember what I was doing, but if you know anything about me, I was probably ha having beginnings of anxiety. I was, I didn't think I was doing coke. When I got into comedy, I really took it seriously. I did coke much later. Once <laughs> once my wife left, there was no reason not to do coke, you know what I'm saying? Now I got the whole house to myself. I could crawl, I could play John Rambo, I could look out windows. But when I got into comedy, I was pretty serious. I think I was just smoking dope. Because I had just gotten off, uh, pissing in a bottle, and something happened. Like, I was like, you know what, if I, I I had picked up all this responsibility at work, so I was getting high like maybe once a week. It wasn't like, so I was still focused. You know, the baby was, I had a baby daughter at the time. She was a year and a half. I'm like, what the fuck am I gonna do? I thought I was just gonna go down there and get on stage and go home. That's what I really thought, that they were gonna boo me I was gonna get hit with a tomato, and I was gonna go back to roofing the next day. And I got off that stage and fucking, you know, I think for two hours, I just sat there with my mouth open, and my body felt like it had never felt before. No drug could ever match that feeling after I got on stage the first time. Well, it, 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 to me, it sounds like a lot like what you're talking about is happening now happened to you a few years from this point when you got kicked out of Denver and you had to make the choice to leave. Yeah. Cuz you your all of your opportunity was taken from you. I got well no. I I still had here's the thing. Listen guys. Nobody should ever give you an invite to leave. If you're smart enough, you read it and you go. You know, I had a situation that I knew I had to get rid of something in December. And I woke up January 21st and I got rid of that person. I loved that person daily, but I just couldn't work with them anymore. I had to get rid of them. And I knew it for a while. Um, 
What was your question? Just about how, how it's how, similar now to when you left Denver. When I left Denver, I had I got thrown out of the comedy works, but I still had McKelvey's. I still had Wits End, and Tribble had a run there, and Jimmy Abeda had four or five rooms that paid. And the other guy had two or three weeks of paid work. I had work there. I can't say I had tons of work there. I had work there. But again, even then, I was letting God control my life without knowing. I let it follow. I mean, I went to fucking Michigan to do, like in May of Memorial Day weekend, I drove to Michigan to do my first feature spot at a club, like it was like a cold MC spot. Like I opened up the show, but I did 20 minutes. Right. And I did well, I was really in shock. And I met a girl and then she came back. So in the process, it, it, it in 95, 95 wasn't a good year for me. It, 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 I was in a position where I was spinning my wheels. I was doing great work as a comic. As a comic, I was doing great fucking work. But everything else in my life was shit. I was waiting around for receipts outside Kmart. <laughs> you know, what the fuck is that? What the what type of human being does that? You know, I was just returning shit. I was, you know, I would sell drugs. I would sell Valium then. I had a Valium guy that worked at Lincoln Mercury. He would give it to me by the thousand. What? A thousand Valiums, 25 cents. I would sell them for $2. The profit margin was phenomenal. Phenomenal. I always had pocket money. When you sell 10 volumes for fucking whatever, 20 bucks, and they cost you two, are you fucking retarded? That's pretty crazy. 250 and I made 1750 or something like that. So I would sell that. That was my little spare change. And I'm doing fucking comedy, you know. That was my life. And the only reason I was in Boulder was for one thing, to be a father, and they didn't want me to be her father. They didn't want me to be a father. And on the other end, I didn't deserve to be a father. So I planned it out. I met that girl. She came and got me. <coughs> she stayed with me for a week in Boulder. And then she went to Seattle. And I left to Seattle maybe a week and a half later. I never looked back. When she offered, when she offered you to, to go, did any part of you hold back or... Sure, you were I held right decision? back. Yeah. Sure, I held back. I had a daughter there. I had roots there. I had been there for twelve years. I did my time. You I was paid. there for twelve years. Wow. I was in Boulder from. I was in Boulder from ninety. I was in Boulder from eighty six to ninety five. But I was in Colorado total from 83 to 95, 12 years. I was in Boulder from 86. I hit Boulder November of 86. That's a long time. I, str I struggle with uh, with uh, decisions like that. I, like, I, if someone told me, hey, it's time to leave, yeah, I like that. But if, I, if it's something that I have to make my decision... I go back and forth. I'm not, I'm Listen, between awesome. you and I and the fourth wall, I knew it was time to leave in May. I knew it was time to leave. I had a funny feeling. I did not know about that they were going to reclose. I didn't know anything about that. But I thought it was time to leave in May. Oh, you mean L.A.? Yeah. In May, I was already telling people. I talked Rick Ramos into it. He got the fuck out of here. I talked my other friend to it. He got the fuck out of here. They, it made sense. They called me and I told them, you got to go. I understand your pain. I understand what you're going through. And I wouldn't be here. Can you imagine how many people would have left if they knew it was going to last this long? Like if, if in March you knew it was going <laughs> to last all year, I bet 20% 20, uh, 20 more people would leave. When I got the call from Rogan last week that he's leaving next month, that really just equated for me that that's it. It's time to... Look around and say, wow, I pay 13.8% in tax. The police is getting defunded. The prisoners are getting out and crime is on the rise. And I have a daughter in my house. 
and there's people walking around looking for a problem. Have you ever taken a ride at night lately? No. Take a ride at 11 o'clock at night. Go to Lancashire and make a left and go up towards Victory. Wait till you get to Victory. Wait till you see up there. Oh, and by Gold's Gym, it's, it's demolished up there. There's nothing up there. Oh, my entire God. entire my streets. Gold, my, gold, my Gold's Gym, they built a mall. They got a new mall. There's a mall to the right, but they were building that far right, before right. this. That's where the first Karen threw her fit. Yeah, at, at that Trader fucking Joe's, yeah. Trader Joe's, right there. That's where the first Karen went in there and said, "Go fuck yourself." I have breathing problems and <laughs> yeah. shit. Yeah, but but I mean, the, on the main street, actually on Laurel Canyon, like there used to be a couple o- a- empty businesses, couple open businesses. Now there's just blocks of empty. Guys, it's fucking. Listen, there was a <laughs> pie store there called Four Twenty. Do you know I went on a date? To 420 in 1997 with a girl up here that lived up here. Wow. I went to one date with her, and we met there for a piece of pie and coffee. Nothing happened. We just met to talk. Her goals were different than mine. (laughs) And, uh, but I still remember going in there in 1997, coming up from Hollywood, making the U-turn, parking in there, going, wow. Getting like a piece of Dutch apple pie, not giving a fuck. With ice cream and after just having a Chinese buffet somewhere. <laughs> and so when I moved to the valley, I would take my wife there for breakfast. They had an okay breakfast. But then we'd get the pie. Oh, yeah. And then yeah, she was pregnant. I'm gaining weight by the fucking day because she's pregnant. <laughs> I'm getting to be a fat fuck, so I stopped going in there. But one day my daughter said to me, my wife said to me, you know, 420 is going out of business in Van Nuys. They had one on Van Nuys. And I was like, that's fucking crazy because they have all those car dealers. Right. How can they go out of business? But listen, once you... Well, that, that's where it is. Oh, wow. That's where it is. But then there's a 420 on Laurel Canyon. Yeah. Across from Gelson's. So my daughter and I were talking and she goes, Dad, I can go for a piece of pumpkin pie. I go, you know what? <laughs> After the podcast, I'll take it for a piece of pumpkin pie. Let's go support local businesses. So we put our mask on. We went in there. We went in there. We go, come. We got a piece of pumpkin pie. Guy looked me straight in the face and he goes, We got apple. We got cherry. And we got cheesecake. We're closing on Sundays. And I'm like, What? Like, well, just give me two pieces of whatever for my wife. Both of them didn't like the pie. Like, it was, it was just made with the last. <laughs> yeah, they're probably. They were just putting the last of the shit in there. And they closed. And they wrote an article about it. I don't know how many years they were there. But you have to look at this as a human being. So, uh, yeah, we're starting to look. We'll still keep doing the podcast. I don't know if Lee will want to move to whatever destination I choose. I I hope he does. Uh, This is going to be very hard here. The next two years... uh, you know, as Lee has seen, rents are not really <laughs> they don't give a fuck out here. dropping. You know, all the I know New York has a rent moratorium going in July thirty first and people getting evicted. I'm sure a lot of people are gonna get evicted here. But what's even the point? If like 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 what you're saying with your friend, the rent's due in September still. Like just that's the only thing that I think is positive about this, is that there's no there's nothing to be ashamed about if stuff goes badly. No, I told and if the you have dear to move with your mine, mom or something. I told the dear friend of mine yesterday. He knows he has to close his business, so I went over there to visit him. He was outside, and I spoke to him. And I looked him in the face, and I go, "I want you to know something. I want you to know that you're a good, good guy. I want you to know that you provide a great service. You've done a lot of great things here. Now, this is out." Of your control. So if anybody's going through this stuff, listens to this podcast, remember these words. You are not God. You are not Jesus. You're not Buddha. You're not any higher power. Everybody's going through something right now. And don't be shameful if you have to move back with your mom. Don't be ashamed if you have to move into your fucking car. Don't be ashamed to ask for help. Not right now. Not right now. Listen, guys, I'm going to make a confession to you guys that I don't talk about on this podcast. 
the comedy store. And I don't even know why I'm telling you this, but I just want you to know what's going on in my world. For the last three years at the comedy store, I was doing main room shows. You know that. And because I sell tickets, they would pay me good money and they would give me cash. So Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays was nice. Guys, you know, I got paid 15 bucks for 20 years. I deserved the raise, okay? Let's put it that way. For fucking 18 years, I got $15, just like Joe Rogan, just like Paul Mooney, just like everybody else, just like Richard Pryor, just like Bobby Lee, just like Theo Vaughn, just like Bill Burr. But when you did the main room, they paid you and they paid you cash. And they gave you some good money. Now, I did something. I would take that cash, because I'm not ashamed to tell you guys. I would take that cash and I would put it in an envelope and put it in the safe. Never counted it. And then I'd do another scam. I skim from myself on the road. You know me, dog. <laughs> I'm the only guy that can rob himself, okay? You charge yourself a VIG? I charge myself a VIG. <laughs> They're supposed to give me money for a plane ticket. I always make them give me 500 bucks cash and yardsticks. They're like, why? I don't know. And then I get home and nobody knows nothing because that's part of my plane money. You follow what I'm saying to you? So I take that $500, I open the safe, and I put it in there. I don't even have the safe no more. I got rid of it because I'm like, somebody's going to break in and take the safe. <laughs> okay. So I didn't, I'll tell you why I got rid of the safe. First of all, I had nothing else in there. <laughs> I had a gun in there. That's it. I took it out now because now you got to protect yourself. So, but I'm going to be honest with you guys. For three years, every Tuesday and Thursday, I went to the comedy store and they gave me cash. I would go home and throw in that envelope. Never, never counted it. Didn't want to count it. I said, I'm going to save this for a rainy day. Something's going to happen for a rainy day. And I kept putting whatever they were, 300s, 500s, you know, 750, whatever they would give me. And this is the first time I've ever discussed money with you guys. I would put in this envelope. COVID came along one day. I said, somebody called me and said they were having a hard time. before, Like uh, two weeks before COVID, a dear friend of mine, I said, I got you covered. What's the amount that you need? And they told me it, was, it wasn't a lot of money, but, you know, it was money. I go, no problem. I, I mean, he was a childhood friend of mine. He bailed me out of 13 million fucking things. And he's struggling now. I want to repay the favor. So I went into the envelope and I was going to give my wife it, the cash to deposit it to write him a check so it wouldn't come out of the house. You know, my wife wouldn't say, you know, that's house money you're giving to your friends. I took that money and I counted it. I don't want to tell you how much money was in that envelope. But let's say it was 20 grand in cash plus. Wow. Because it was three years of filling that envelope every week with comedy store money. Okay, and they were all $100 bills. Damn, let's go to Vegas. Do you know what? What? There's not a $100 bill left. Wow. Remember, I gave 5000 to the store. I took that money, and I sent it out to my friends who I knew would need it. I didn't want them to ask me. I never, you never let a friend embarrass themselves when they're going through hell. So before they could even ask, I just put it in my fucking PayPal account and sent it out. Without even asking, they called and said, Joey, we don't want the money, but you're not going to believe this. We didn't even know how we were going to pay our shop this month. One friend of mine called. He goes, I didn't even know how I was going to pay my shop. And I figured that was my, that's how I could help during this time, you know. I think I took a couple hundred for a cat shelter. And I donated money from the church to the men, North Hollywood 
whatever. I went over there, dropped off clothes, and gave him three bills cash. I dropped off all my sweatpants, my big fat man sweatpants and shit. I had 20 hooded sweatshirts. I just put them in a bag when they had that homeless thing up here in North Hollywood, and I went up there and dropped off, and I gave the lady 300 cash. That was left from that money. That's it. I don't, I'm not mad. That's what that money was for. A rainy fucking day. But it was, I thought it was going to be for me. It ended up being for my friends. And that's what you live life for. And that's it. Granted, I'm, I'm sure everyone can use some money. But selfishly, does, does it feel a little bit, does it, did it feel good to have people be that, like, happy? Like, I know you know that's not why you did it, but when you make someone that happy, it has to make you feel good. You know how many steaks Joe Rogan bought me? You know how many TV shows Shadik like the Entertainer put me in? Do you have any idea how many times Ralphie May took care of me? Uh, who was here last week? Josh Wool. I would tell you the time he took me to buy three pair of suits for a TV show. You know, I think Brody gave me a couple hundred one time to eat. This is what happens, brother. You can't ask back or you can't ask it back. Josh Wolf never asked back for the money for the suits. You know, you know how many times I just had the balls to ask Rogan for a hundred bucks? And he would give it to me without blinking an eye, knowing it was for drugs. But what can he do? He didn't want me to rob somebody or something like that. So I don't know. I mean, uh, I've had very good friends that have been very good to me. How can I deny? And these are kids from Jersey. These are all kids. It was a couple waitresses, you know. But these were kids from Jersey that, you know, they go back to the sixth grade with me. I asked everybody. I asked a couple of friends, and they said they were all right, but I knew a handful of them that weren't all right. I had one friend that was moving into a new place, and I knew he needed the deposit. And right before he asked, boom, I just sent him a fucking certified check. You know, he doesn't have PayPal. This is what this life is about, is remembering, you know, especially in times like this. I wish I could do more. I wish, I wish I was Bill Gates and I could do more and I could just, you know, but I, I'm not, you know, I could just do what I could do. So this is a time right now that your bank account means nothing because there's somebody missing a fucking meal. Well, it's the truth. It's the fucking truth. You know what else I did? I, I joined a, a bunch. I subscribed to a bunch of people's Patreons. Nice. I took some money. I'm not going to tell you who. Some dirty girls. I bought their OnlyFans. <laughs> I want because I wanted to look. But the reason why I did it was because I want to look at what people are putting out there. What I'm doing is you listen, supported a paint and a painter. Tomorrow is my uh, 29th anniversary in comedy. I've been doing a podcast with you guys for years. I Instagram with you guys for years. I periscope with you guys for years, and I got a new idea. I want to do a show called The Mind of Joey Diaz, and I'm going to tell you some stuff you're going to know, some stuff you're not going to know. I'm going to put it on Patreon. It's going to be uh, patreon.com slash Joey Diaz. It's uh, a couple videos a week, some inspirational stuff, some vlogs. I'm going to write some blogs in there also. And the beauty of it is, it's a dollar. You want to give $2? Give $2. I don't give a fuck. You want to judge me? Give me $5. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> what I'm doing is this. Um, my guy that shoots the videos, he's not working. He's a director. Uh, I wish I could pay him from the church money, but as you guys see, even our ads are down. So I'm going to have him use videos, you know, uh, my friend Mike Klein does all the posters and uh, he puts up all the videos and he's at a peak also where 
he doesn't think he's going back to work. So what I'm trying to do with this dollar is uh, spread it around. This is going to be the mind of Joey Diaz. It's a magazine. My, it's a Patreon account. It's got nothing to do with the podcast. Podcast is still going to come on Mondays and Wednesdays. I'm not fucking with the podcast. This, this is this is you guys all day long. It's a jo- uh, Patreon.com slash Joey Diaz. This helps uh, two, three people. Uh, doesn't make them rich, but it helps them out. And we're going to take a little bit every month and donate to a, a cat. Thing. My wife is looking for a legitimate cat thing to put up on the on the Patreon. Uh, I'm going to give you inspirational things in the morning because they have a 15 second video. All right. That I love the I love it. So I could just go on there and call you a motherfucker, cocksucker, son of a bitch. Uh, I've already I've been practicing on a fake site that my manager made me for the last week, and they fucking loved it. They came over and they were like, "This is." They're going to go crazy. So it probably goes live uh, sometime Friday. You know, when uh, we do an Instagram Friday night, 7 p.m. You're around or you're going to Vegas this weekend? No, I'm here. Any fights this weekend? I think so, yeah. Okay, good. So we'll do, we'll do, we'll be back Friday night. We'll do a little Instagram live at 7 o'clock at night. Just let's smoke a joint, you know? What the fuck? You're going to stay in again and just sit in your house and fart all night, Lee? <laughs> But yeah, I thought this would be an interesting idea. I don't have a day job no more, guys. I don't have a night job no more. I'm not looking for a handout. I'm looking to be held to something. I'm looking for somebody to hold me to my commitment. And the only way I could do that is I can't charge you $5. And I'm not going to charge you $10. I'm not worth that kind of money. But that's why I got a couple people's Patreons to support them and to see what they were doing. And I got some dirty broads to help them out. You know, just to see what the fuck they're doing. Those are disgusting pages. They're just disgusting. I haven't seen them yet. Yeah, it's just, you know, I, I was thinking of doing it only fans, and they're a great service. They provide a great thing. But my manager was tied with the dude from Patreon. So uh, we talked to him, and he thought it was a good idea. And when I told him, I just want a dollar. That's it. Listen, uh, the social networks now, Twitter and Facebook, you know what, bro, guys? They get a little bit too crazy. They get a little bit too crazy. Tonight, some guy wrote on there, uh, when you ate that girl's pussy, you robbed the girl. I never said no way I robbed the girl. We robbed her boyfriend. We robbed the guy she was working for. People are taking everything the wrong way, whether it's whether you say something funny, whether you say something. I don't, you know me. I don't post politically or nothing like that. I just tell you to go. Like, I fought it. Today, I showed you a picture of me on the bike. With the helmet. Did you see that? Yeah. With the nice little red helmet. Just to let you know, I got problems too. I got problems just like everybody else. I put a little red helmet on and shit like a Momo. I got my little face mask out there riding the bike for 50 fucking minutes. I almost got hit twice today. It's crazy out there. Yeah, it's crazy. I go to that park and I just do circles around the loop. I go all the way to Laurel Canyon, past the cold water. I just go on all the side streets. And it's great. I do it at 9.30 in the morning. My anxiety fucking goes away. Because when I get up, I got to do something. So when my wife takes the baby to fucking camp, boom, I bust on that fucking bike. (coughs) No iPod, no hearing aids, no nothing. It's just me and fucking nature out there. And I'm loving it. You know, I'm trimming down a little bit. I'm feeling better. And it's because of you guys, what we've been doing here. So again, it's patreon.com. Slash Joey Diaz, a dollar, a dollar. That's it. If next month you want to give two dollars, you give two dollars. It's a dollar, four fucking quarters. You understand me? Four fucking quarters. Patreon.com slash Joey Diaz. That's it. Nice and easy. I just want to check in with you guys and let you know we're all going through shit. We're all going through shit. Fuck it. No, we're not Kim Kardashian. We're not up there hanging out with Kanye West with a waitress. For serving this fucking shrimp. We're dying down here, too. We're with you guys, man. So, you know, I love you motherfuckers with all my heart. But first, listen. The Church of What's Happening Now is also brought to you by Express VPN. Right now, we're all living our lives on the Internet. 
Your kids got school on the iPad. Your wife's got the in-laws on FaceTime. You're trying to watch porn. You know, <laughs> now more than ever, you need to protect your privacy. You don't want people to know you're watching black midgets jump up and down and they're fucking other little African-American midgets. You don't want nobody to see that, do you? So I hate to break it to you, you know. Why not use a private code? Because it doesn't work, cocksuckers. No matter how many times you erase your history, people can still see every site you've ever visited. That's not a good fucking thing. For me, it is. I don't give a fuck. I don't go to bad sites. I don't even know <laughs> nothing about the underworld. But with ExpressVPN, I do online. It's nobody's business, okay? The way it works, instead of going directly from your house to the internet, everything I do online goes to Ex ExpressVPN Secure Service. It's like putting a rubber on before you bang the internet and you're anonymous. You get an IP address that cannot be tracked. Your info is secure. ExpressVPN encrypts 100%, 100% of your personal data. And it works for every person and device in your home. Again, it works for every person and device in your home. It's easy as pie to use, even for a fucking Momo like me. Just push one button. Seamless, right? Listen, if you think putting your browser on private will keep the Russians from knowing what the fuck you jerk off to, you're slipping, cocksucker. So do me a favor. To protect your online activity today, go to VPN. I trust them to secure my privacy. My wife uses it right now. The Church of What's Happened Now family. Go to expressvpn.com slash church, C-H-U-R-C-H, -H, to get three extra months free on your one-year subscription. That's expressvpn.com slash church. Again, support the podcast and protect yourself, guys, because people are rummaging through shit right now. Go to ExpressVPN right when you listen to this podcast, dot com slash church. I'm going to get you three free months on a year. So that means you pay for nine months. I'm getting you a deal. All right. Uh, ExpressVPN, I want to thank them. I want to thank on it. But most importantly, I want to thank you guys. Like I said, you're going to be really surprised with this mind of Joey Diaz. I'm going to blow your mind right from the fucking jump. So get ready to get your mind blown. And uh, if not, I'll see you. Next time I see you, I'll give you a fucking dollar, right? I love you guys. The church of what's happening now. We'll be back Monday morning to talk about tarot cards. Kick this fucking mule, Lou. Let's get the fuck out of here.